you handed me all this on, on, on our next speaker. But some of the things he, he's done, I mean, and he tells me that in his last uh, year, he's been on sabbatical. Uh, he, he teaches up at uh, St. Lawrence uh, University up in New York, I believe that's right. Yeah. Uh, in, in the last year, he's been uh, traveling to Europe and uh, other interesting places, and, and uh, maybe can tell you a little more about that. But Paul Conant has been working tirelessly to deal with the issues that Solomon had in this waste incineration, uh, has written more about the oxen than I have read, uh, and is just a, a wonderful resource, and uh, I think probably one of the more entertaining speakers. Uh, and if you haven't seen any of Paul Conant's videos, uh, I would encourage you to uh, track them down. Uh, Paul will probably be glad to make them available. But uh, he and his wife are doing a wonderful job up in New York and have helped just thousands of groups across the United States and other countries. Uh, helped to begin to understand what some of these serious environmental issues are. It's worked extensively with uh, groups outside of the United States. So, uh, Paul, turn it to you. Please follow. Well, the official title of my talk is Dioxin 101, but before I do that, it's a few minutes on waste 101, because I think the issues that you're interested in here overlap with the waste issues. And so I'm going to begin where I usually begin with definitions of waste. Waste is a human invention. Nature makes no waste, otherwise we'd be need the giraffe manure by now. Waste is a verb, not a noun. You cannot find anything isolated which you could call waste. Waste is the act of putting it all together somewhere. It's a verb, not a noun. Waste is resources in their own place. Waste is the visible face of inefficiency. Waste is the evidence that we are doing something wrong. But the best definition of waste by far comes from Joe Barbarino, who is a waste hoarder, or was a waste hoarder in North Northern California, he's now into the recycling business. And the Joe Garbarino waste is a busload of consultants going over the Niagara Falls with three empty seats in it. <laughs> and well, each of those consultants has a name, and of course, their names have a letter. And the three empty seats introduces to the three letter curse, which probably also holds your world too. Let's have a closer look at the three letter curse. CDM. Camp Dresser and the King, a firm of engineering consultants who have spread uh, its synergy like a play across Florida. Uh, HDR, Hennings, Durham, and Richardson. GBB, Gershwin, Rickman, and Brown. BFI, WMI, Waste Management Corporate, CIA, KGB, KKK, EBA, DNR, DEB, DEC, TEN. Now all these three letters add up to one combination, the RIC, the Regulatory Industrial Complex, which is rapidly replacing the Military Industrial Complex in terms of its insidious impacts on the United States. Now this Regulatory Industrial Complex has, of course, the regulatory agencies, the industries, and the consultants who serve as midwives delivering the technologies and the jobs to the regulatory agencies. And these reg this regulatory industrial complex, I believe, distorts local politics, corrupts science, denies common sense, threatens both our local and global environments, and also threatens democracy. And in my dealings on the waste issue, I find that uh, there are many people out there spending 24 hours a day fighting on this issue. Half of them are fighting because of their concern about the chemicals, about the toxics. The other half are fighting because of their concern about what these strategies used by industry, in the particular case, the waste industry, is doing to uh, the democracy. Uh, they're, sh they're shocked and they're frightened. Which brings me to two laws of waste, or two laws of pollution, if you like. On a state-by-state -state basis, you can 
very easily show that the level of pollution increases as the level of corruption. The more corrupt your state, the more polluted your state can be. Florida is right on the top of that. So <laughs> uh, that's the bad law. The good law is that the level of pollution decreases as the level of public participation. And whilst I'm here and on the same platform as Willie, I mentioned Willie all over the country because I think it's, it says a lot for somebody in the state of Louisiana to have somebody work in the Attorney General's office whose sole job is to organize the citizens. So it's fantastic. Just, just the recognition that the citizens are not the enemy, but the greatest ally if we are determined to clean up the environment and protect our planet. By and large, I do not believe that we're dealing with evil people. There are one or two out there, I think. But, most of them are just blood boring. They're boring. They're very boring people in regulatory agencies, you know? If you, uh, George Bernard Shaw says, if you can, you do it, you can't, you teach. And I say, if you can't teach, then you go to regulatory agencies. Uh, very, very boring people. Boring people in consulting agencies. Boring people in the way industry. Very boring people in the paper industry. Very boring people. They have no vision. They're preoccupied with making money, uh, whatever that means. Very boring people. If you like, another way of saying the same thing is that they're back-end thinkers, as opposed to front-end thinkers. They think that they're rear-ends, and that's why their products, <laughs> their products are so absolutely awful. Anyway, to, 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 to help you appreciate the difference between a back-end thinker and a front-end thinker, we have the famous overflowing bar of it's not famous now, but it will. All right. You come into your apartment and the bathtub is overflowing. What do you do? If you're a vacuum thinker, you grab a bucket and try to empty this bathtub. Now, the bucket may not be sufficient, so you turn to a foot pump, the best available control then on And state of the art, then if that doesn't work, then you turn to an electric pump and then improve the quality of your electricity by getting more nuclear power well, and, and on and on and on. Whereas a front end thinker switches off the tap. <laughs> so I love this, this argument that's going on with paper and pulp industry. How, how much dioxin is tolerable? <laughs> um, would you like a pico brand? So here's one-on-one on, one on dioxin. First of all, there are millions 
of compounds up there, but only a hundred building blocks, which we call elements. Each element has a name and has a symbol, a hundred Lego bricks. It turns out that carbon, there are more combinations containing carbon than all the rest of the compounds put together. And that's why carbon is the basis of life and also the basis of the petrochemical industry. And one of the fascinating things that carbon can do, as well as forming long chains in plastics and other polymers, is it can form rings. And an important ring structure that you need in order to unravel the structures of thousands of materials is this benzene ring, this hexagon, a hexagon of carbon atoms with a hydrogen at each corner. C6H6. And the symbol, most of you get scared when you use symbols. Just a shortcut, shorthand. The shorthand for this is this hexagon with a circle in the middle. And that's what I'm going to use from now on to save writing our only tablets. But that's what we mean. Now, one of the things that we can easily do in the chemical industry and in the laboratory is to replace one or more of these hydrogens with a chlorine atom. And if we did that in this particular case, we would get a substance C6H5, one hydrogen is removed, and a chlorine is put in its place. Chlorobenzene. Okay. Now, this substance is called biphenyl. We could have called it carrots or spinach or something, but we called it biphenyl. There's two <laughs> benzene rings joined together. Okay. Now, if I do what I've just set up here, replace some of those hydrogen atoms, any, any from one to ten, with chlorine, I get a family of compounds called poly, meaning several, chlorinated biphenyls, or PCBs. There's 209 different ways of doing that, so we have 209 PCBs, which turn out to be pretty toxic. And they were banned in this country in 1976, I believe. Now, if you burn PCBs incompletely, what happens? is that an oxygen can close that gap there. Now that family of compounds is called polychlorinated dibenzofuranes. There's 135 of those, and we use the word furans for short. The furans, okay? Again, 135, because there's 135 different ways of putting the chlorine around. Now if we put two oxygens between these two rings, then we get another family of compounds called lust dioxins. And there's 75 of those. So altogether we have 210 dioxins and furans. And we make all 210 when we burn trash, if the trash has chlorine in it. And particularly if it's got plastic with chlorine in it. So there's 210 dioxins and furans which have chlorine in it. But it's worse than that. Because if we, sub we can also put bromine in here, there's another 210 dioxins and furans which have bromine in it instead of chlorine. We have less bromine in the waste stream, but we can still get bromine in dioxin. And finally, there's over 5,000 dioxins and furans which have some chlorine and some bromine in it. So we have a, a tremendous number of these substances. Now, when we come to naming the specific compounds, we have to be very careful about where we are saying the chlorine is, because it turns out that chlorine in different positions can make the difference between a relatively non-toxic substance to a very, very toxic substance. So we number the rings like this, one, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, nine. Deep breath, because in a moment I'm going to test you on this. Okay. <laughs> this substance then is called two, three, seven, eight, identifying where the chlorine is. Then we use the Greek for four, tetra. Greek mono, di, tri, tetra, penta, hexa, hexa, octa. That's all you need to remember. Okay. <laughs> Chloro meaning we put chlorine in there. Dibenzo, forget the little p, dibenzodioxin, which is this parent molecule that we were talking about up here. Now, let me test you. What would you call the substance that had bromine substituted at 2, 3, this position, here and here? Alright, let's, let's go for a, a, a little victim. Do you look like a useful victim? Yes. 
and I put a perm in here too. Quantities 
You could argue that benzene overall is a bigger problem for industry than dioxins, but it's, com it's confusing two factors, the toxicity of the material and the quantity that you're exposed to. You cannot argue away dioxins potency. It's the most potent carcinogen that the EPA has ever studied. It's 50 million times more potent than vinyl chloride in rat study. 50 million times. Now just realize what that means. Suppose you had a hazardous waste incinerator, and one of the things that you were burning was vinyl chloride. You would have to, and one of the byproducts of burning vinyl chloride is dioxin. And you would have to satisfy yourself that you were producing less dioxin by a factor of 50 million than the original vinyl chloride that you were burning, otherwise the overall toxicity would be greater. Now, the, the, the figure that everybody goes back to as the baseline for establishing these numbers that people throw around is the cancer study done by Casibra at Dow, in which the cancer rates in animals uh, was caught. An increased cancer rate in rats is caused by 10 nanograms, 10 billionths of a gram per kilogram body weight fed over a two year period. And another level that is used for regulatory standards is the no observable adverse effect level in rats, which is one nanogram per kilogram body weight. So 10 nanograms per kilogram gives them cancer, one doesn't appear to do uh, anything to, to the rat. And these are the two numbers that have been used in different ways. I want to start with the one nanogram per kilogram body weight. In some countries, like Canada and Germany, and most of the others in between, they take that no observed effect level and divide by a safety factor, either 100 in the case of Canada, or Germany, in the, 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 1,000 in the case of Germany. And they get what is called the allowable daily intake, the ADI, or the acceptable daily intake, or the tolerable daily intake. And this is based upon lifetime exposure. The notion is that you're allowed to take this quantity per day for 70 years, on average. You could get a situation where somebody gets their lifetime dose in the first few weeks. But overall, the lifetime, the daily dose is 10 picogram per kilogram by the way in Canada, and in Germany it's 1 picogram. Well, here's the shock. Here's the shock for the citizens of Germany and to a lesser extent in Canada. When they measured the levels of dioxin in food from the supermarkets in Germany and in Canada, they found that people were getting between one and two picograms per kilogram body weight per day, which is 100 to 200% of the allowable daily intake in Germany and 10 to 20% of the Canadian ADI. So now some people are shopping in Canada and eating their food, sorry, shopping in Germany and eating their food in Canada to, to, to be very safe with this whole issue. Now, this is incredible. It's, what you're telling the citizens is that just by eating, you're exceeding your allowable day eating. This could set off two reactions. One reaction is to say, my God, we have got to find every source of dioxin and cut it out now. That's one response. The other response is to say, well, maybe we've been a little hasty in establishing this now. Maybe we should raise it to the point that we don't have to tell the public that they're exceeding their allowed data data. And we've seen both. We've seen both responses. Uh, right now, the World Health Organization raised it from 1 to 10, precisely because of that reason. Even more devastating than that is the fact that mother's breast milk delivers to a nursing infant between 100 and 200 picograms per kilogram body weight a day, which is 100 times the allowable daily intake, 10,000% of the allowable daily intake, and 10 to 20 if your baby is in Canada. Now, the argument, the argument is, of course, that the baby does not get breastfed for 70 years. They have 69 years to recover. The counter argument is, hey, hey, that 
that first year is quite a precious and sensitive year. There's all kinds of systems developing, and goodness knows what the level is in the in the uterus, in, in the uh, in the uh, fetus, what the fetus is yet. Now, the EBA has a different approach. It does not have an allowable in daily intake. The EPA's position for a probable human carcinogen is that there is no safe level, which sounds good on paper, until you realize what they do with that. And so they, they establish the fact that 0 0.006 picograms per kilogram body weight per day would give an increased cancer risk of one in a million. And that is supposed to be the benchmark of concern. So right now, according to the EPA, our, our baseline cancer risk just from consuming food in the supermarket is between what? 100, uh, 150 and over 300 per minute just from the food in the supermarket. That's a cancer risk. It sounds as if we're getting awfully good protection from the EPA here, except these risk assessments, A, do not seem to trigger off much, much action. And B, they're in the hands of the prostitutes. The cancerous assessments are done by these firms who are not scientists as much as scientists for hire. They don't produce objective documents really trying to find out what the risks are. They essentially come in and prove that this effluent is safe, this incinerator is safe. That is what they are paid for. It's a pseudo-scientific exercise to rationalize a political decision or an existing uh, situation to continue. And just so you don't think I'm just totally paranoid, I want to give you an example of prostitution. And that's not, I don't mean to insult a noble profession. This is an even older profession than prostitution. This, this makes prostitution, as we know it in the common currency, look respectable. I think this will do far more damage than, than that. Okay, this is a covenant, a comment that a lawyer, a firm of lawyers, Richard Cogan in this case, wrote on the cover page of a draft health risk assessment done for a trash incinerator in my own county. It reads, overall comments, the risk numbers still come out too high, especially the 10 to the minus 4 for infants. So the consultant has done his job, has come back with an incremental cancer risk for nurse, nursing infants of 100, over 100 in a minute, 10 to the minus 4. Now what's this comment? I've got three possible explanations. One is that this lawyer is also a risk consultant, and he's seen that his colleague has made a boo-boos, and he's correcting him. Second possibility, he has direct access to God, this lawyer, who's told him that consultant is made of moose, and he's got to correct it. And the third possibility, this is simply a lawyer corrupting science. This is a lawyer trying to get a better number to defend in the permitting process. Now, of course, the consultant denies Robert Michaels, Dr. Robert Michaels, environmental toxicologist, denies that this had any influence on him, and yet here is the draft health risk assessment where there's the circle from the lawyer, the minus 10 to minus 4, 115 in a million, and in the final, it's down to 14 in a million, from 115 dropped down to 14 in a million. So don't think, because the EPA standard is set below the, the European standards, it looks as if we are better protected than the Europeans. There's plenty of evidence to indicate that countries like Germany and Holland take those levels seriously and act upon them. And there's plenty of evidence in the United States that we do not act upon those levels, and if there's any debate about it, we pay to get the studies that we want. Meanwhile, there's another movement afoot, and that is through the media, and I'm sure you're all aware of this, there are a number of science so-called scientists out there, Curtis Travis, Michael Goff, uh, Vernon Halk, and others, who are uh, Palestine back, and a few others, who are going around the country saying that dioxins, whilst they're terrible for animals, don't seem to be too bad for human beings. 
aren't we lucky? They can always tell bogus science because they usually use the words good science about a dozen times in their presentation. We need good science! We need good science! Whenever they say we need good science, good science, you know they're lying through their teeth. Well, Vernon Howick is a renowned figure. Um, he has systematically botched the Agent Orange studies now for a number of years. I remember when I first got involved in waste back in 1985-86, there was an article in the New York Times of Vernon Howick apologizing for their inability to study women in Vietnam, that they couldn't study the women who served in Vietnam, something about them being volunteers, and if they volunteered for this study, it would throw the whole thing out. So women were not studied. And then we've now recently found that after Vernon Howe said he would do a, what, a $50 million study on Agent Orange, they turn around after a few years and say they, they can't find who has been exposed in Vietnam. Baloney! It's an absolute lie! If you talk to Jean Stone and her husband, who are nationally, internationally known epidemiologists, they have the data. They know exactly where the people were who were exposed. They've got all the army, army records. But apparently Vernon Health didn't see that. So there was a big congressional hearing, and we had one of the chairmen of that hearing, Mark Smoloni, uh, Mark Smolonsky, the investigator for that hearing, and he's an excellent speaker if you want to get somewhere talk about this issue. He is the investigator for the House Subcommittee on Intergovernmental Relations and Human Resources. He works for Ted Weiss from New York. And he held this hearing, the Agent Orange cover-up, a case of flawed science and political manipulation. And this study absolutely revealed Vernon House activities and White House pressures that were exerted on the CDC uh, not to find anything in that Agent Orange story, to deliberately mess up that story. Because they were, the gov the, there are letters in this report, there are letters here from the White House, from lawyers for the White House, who pointed out if they, were, if they gave compensation for dioxin exposure to the Vietnam vets, then it would open up a can of worms and they'd have to give compensation to all the, the, the civilian victims of dioxin and hazardous waste and nuclear radiation victims and so on. They did not want to open that can of worms, whoosh, shut that story down. And that's what we've been seeing ever since. You know, and if you get a chance to read this book, I suggest you do it. it it's fairly old now, waiting for an army to die. And that's what we've been doing. We have been stalling for time and allowing those Vietnam vets to die. And when we're all dead, some bloody historian will come along and tell us that they were damaged by dioxin. But it will be too late for most of them and too late for most of their wives. And it's sickening to read this because that's what's happening. I've never fought for my country. I've never been put in the trenches. I've never had to face bullets, dynamite, bombs, or any of that other stuff. But I'm certain about this. If I fought in Vietnam or Korea or any of these other wars, and I came back to this country, having risked my life in this country, and some bloody government official lied to me, I wouldn't rest until I had that man's resignation. I want Bernard out of there. I want every single government official who's lied in that
history um, telling them how to handle the Vietnam vets who came in with problems. And this is the line that I think is very interesting. They say, experimental evidence from animal studies indicates that this chemical is eliminated from the body fairly rapidly and that it produces its toxic effects rather promptly. All available data suggest that it is not retained in tissues from, for prolonged periods of time. Well, we now know that the half-life of dioxin in human tissues can be as long as seven years. And in rats, of course, it's only about 20 days. So if they're saying it's not a problem because the body clears it very quickly, then they've got some pretty serious explanation to do now. Absolutely upside down, Alice in Wonderland. Now, of course, there is plenty of evidence to the fact that dioxin does cause cancer, is a human problem. We had the pleasure of having Renard Hardell and Michael Erickson at our Citizens Conference on Dioxin last weekend. And here's a hero, here's somebody that stood out against the attacks of industry to say yes, sprayers against being phenoxyherosides contaminated with dioxin do have an increase in soft tissue sarcoma. There were bogus studies from elsewhere who said no. The Cerveso studies in Italy, you're always told there's no indication of long-term health effects. It's not true. There's an increased cancer in the Cerveso areas from this accident. That number two was brought, uh, repeated at this conference in North Carolina. Uh, increase of a number of cancers. And then the other thing which is shocking is the fact that we now know that some of the key studies that industry and the EPA has relied upon were fraudulent. Mary, did you refer to this today? No. The, the BASF study, Rolada, uh, an epidemiologist uh, who's now dead, unfortunately, died very young. He showed that the BASF had, in their study, had taken people that were exposed and put them into the control group, and people that were controls were put into the exposed group. When he unraveled them, indeed, you could see an increase in cancer. And another hero, Kate Jenkins of the EPA, published the fact that indeed the same thing has happened with the Monsanto studies that exposed people who were in the control group and so on. An absolute outrageous manipulation of the data. And incidentally, Kate Jenkins has now produced a definitive document on the human health effects of dioxin. It's about 100 odd pages long. It's the most thorough thing that's been done. It's been done as an affidavit. And I would suggest strongly that anybody who's interested in this issue gets a copy of that affidavit. Just write to Kate Jenkins at the EPA. But before we leave this, um, Mary was anxious, and rightly so, that I point out that, and I should, for some reason, I've missed out the diagram that I, I meant to have here. But I, I missed it, I don't know where it went to. But I should just explain a little bit about dioxin's biochemistry. What happens is that dioxin goes into the cell and there combines with a protein, what we call a receptor, the AH receptor. And the dioxin fits into that receptor like a hand fitting into a glove. And then that combination, after some modifications, then goes into the nucleus of the cell interacts with the DNA, the genetic material, and switches on a series of enzymes. We really don't know quite what happens after those enzymes have been switched on. The point is this, that there are literally hundreds, if not thousands, of compounds that interact with that AH receptor. And one of the things which has particularly people interested in wildlife very concerned is that whilst PCBs are not as toxic as dioxins and furans, they operate by the same mechanism. And there's more PCBs out there in mother's breast milk and in our wildlife than there is dioxins. And we have this system which is called toxic equivalent factors, where we rate on scale the efficiency of this binding process. Now even though some of the PCBs may be a hundred times less effective at binding, some of them are present at 100 times greater levels. And so the 
right now, many people are saying that the levels of PCBs out there gives you the largest quantity of these toxic equivalents. And we've hardly begun to study all the different families, the naphthalines, the quadrinolines, and all the other things which have structures which fit into this receptor molecule. And that's scary too. And I think that the, the, the most disturbing information of all that's come out recently is the Michigan study where they fed women, or women fed, they compared the children, the behavior of children from Michigan mothers who the, the subjects ate fish from Lake Michigan, not much, one or two meals a week. What? Two fish meals a month, thanks, against mothers who hadn't been eating any fish. And you can pick up behavioral problems, learning disabilities with the children that had the mothers that ate the fish. And that's been put down to the PCB levels, but who knows exactly what it is. Um, now, the latest furor that Hauk capitalized on, in fact, Hauk was saying exactly what he's saying today over a year ago before this study came out. His, his language has hardly changed, but he's, he's trying to even indicate that this study proves what he's saying. This is the famous finger hut study, the NIOSH study, which studied four or 5,000 workers in industry exposed to dioxin. Let's just read together the last paragraph of that study, because this has been used by the New York Times, what a bloody awful newspaper, the New York Times, and its front page and its editorials to say that dioxin is not a problem for human beings. Listen to the end. It says, soft tissue sarcoma was an exception. A ninefold increase was found among workers who were exposed for one year or more and who had at least a 20 years of latency, that's a period since exposure. Interpretation of the increased standard mortality ratio is limited, however, by the small number of cases and because the cause of death was sometimes misclassified in the death certificate of the workers in the national comparison population. Continued surveillance of the cohort may provide a firm estimate of risk. Mortality from all cancers combined was 15% higher than expected in the overall cohort. The sub cohort with one year or more of exposure and 20 years more of latency had a 46% increase in all cancers combined and a 42% increase in cancers of the respiratory tract. Although the study could not completely exclude the possible contribution of other occupational carcinogens or smoking, the increased mortality, especially in the sub cohort with one year or more of exposure, is consistent with the status of TCPD as a carcinogen, meaning a human carcinogen. For that to be used by the New York Times, by Michael Goff, by Vernon Howe, to suggest that dioxin is not a human carcinogen, to take the very study which has given us the most definitive evidence that it is a human carcinogen and say it proves the opposite is perverse. It either demonstrates a, a, a very feeble intellectual ability or worse, it's corrupt. Now, the other thing is that people have said, oh, well, it's a carcinogen, it's a human one. Well, and therefore, we should be downgrade the potency used by the EPA, that point zero point zero zero six. We should make that, I think the number that they're aiming for is one picogram per day for cancer. The, the members of the Department of Health Services in California looked at the known tissue levels where they were known against the increased cancer rate in the figure hut study and found that, in fact, the US EPA potency factor is right on target. In other words, the number that we got from rats seems to be confirmed by these numbers in the NIOSH study. Also, at the last symposium that we just had, you know, the argument has been this, is you have to, when you're extrapolating to humans, you have to extrapolate from high doses for rats to low doses in humans. And the big argument is how you make that extrapolation. Well, the EPA does what is called a linear extrapolation. What the industry wants to do is to do a threshold. They want to say below a certain level, there's no effect at all, so you get a graph like this. Okay. 
hand. Other people want to do a graph like that, where it's concave, with a slow increase and then a steady increase. And then other people suggest it may be convex, like that. There's a steeper effect at lower doses. Well, there's been some very, very interesting studies done by Dr. George Lussier of the National Institute of Environmental Health Studies, one of the organizers of the International Symposium. And he is saying that in his animal studies, he cannot find a threshold at all. There doesn't to be any threshold at the biochemical level. And other people in this same group have indicated a potency factor which is even higher than the EPA are using. So that's the backdrop, I hope, scientific, honest scientific backdrop to some of the nonsense that's going on in the press. And I hope that that's useful for nailing this uh, paper pulp uh, levels that are coming up. But my advice is beware of being sucked into these nitty gritty scientific arguments which are going to put a lot of people to sleep where the obvious is staring us in the face. If we don't use chlorine, we won't get dioxins emitted from these plants. That's our task. Get chlorine out of the paper pulp industry. Get chlorine out of the chemical industry. And I'll leave you with one, one last thing. I know we do you want to know. <laughs> one last thing. This, to me, is the gigantic unanswered question. It goes like this. Despite the fact that life evolved from the sea, from a high concentration of chloride ions, of sodium chloride. Despite the fact that every living system has a high concentration of chloride ions in it. Despite the fact that we now know that a number of lower level creatures can convert chloride ions to the carbon chlorine bond, to organo chlorine compounds. There are at least 700 that have been identified, and many algae sea creatures and so on can do it. And therefore there is no kinetic or thermodynamic impediment from nature going from the chloride ion to the carbon chlorine bond. And despite the fact that there are very few non-metals for carbon to choose from, and despite the fact that if she had done it, that having the carbon chlorine bond in things like proteins and amino acids and so on would have given a whole new range of architecture and function and expedite some of those functions. Despite all those advantages, after three or four billion years of experimentation, nature did not introduce the carbon chlorine bond into the mainstream of biochemistry. There is nothing in the human being, there's nothing in the terrestrial mammal which has the carbon chlorine bond in it. And the question is, why did she not do that? And we should have answered that question before we put every year 40 million tons of organochlorine compounds in the environment. And there's one place that we know that those organochlorine compounds are and that is in mother's breast milk. So what I'm trying to tell you, I think, is that we have recognized one of the cataclysmic effects of not asking that question a hundred years ago is that now some of those chlorinated compounds have worked their way up to the stratosphere and are damaging the ozone layer. The microscopic level that we failed to have not recognized to the same extent is that what is happening in the environment, and in our tissues, and in mother's breast milk, I believe, is the sub-microscopic equivalent of the damage to the ozone layer. It may turn out to be one of the limits of human existence on this planet. And so we're dealing with serious issues here, and you would make a large contribution by beating the crap out of the paper pulp industry on this issue. Thank you very much.
the U.S. and Canada, including many, many thousands of workers in the public paper mills, where the primary union in the United States in this industry. You find that our members, especially in the paper mills, it's really a tradition, it's a culture of members that work in these paper mills for generations. Paper making really is a culture uh, in these mill communities around the country. They're usually, although not always, but quite frequently in small rural areas, small town rural areas. Uh, absolutely, they're going to be the best paying jobs because of the effort of our union, the best paying. Uh, most secure, some of the best industrial jobs in this country, and definitely the best in the small towns where they're located. Um, our members are also very, very much aware that they work in one of the most hazardous industries in this country. And as a result of that, our own union has devoted enormous resources and staff time over occupational safety and health programs. We have a full-time OSHA staff that is there to serve our members in terms of promoting uh, safety and health in the uh, workplace. Over the years, especially in recent years, we've increasingly come to realize that this distinction between occupational safety and health on the one hand and environmental health on the other hand is totally arbitrary. It is, there is no difference between OSHA and environment. Um, our members are on the front line. They are the first people who are exposed to the many, many hazardous chemicals used in the paper industry. Our members are painfully aware that we experience uh, high levels of cancer, paper mill workers do, higher than the uh, general population. And our members care very much about their health and safety in the workplace. They care very much about health and safety in the community because they live in the community. Their families live in the community. And of course, we're very much concerned about the uh, standard of living for our members. Uh, our members are also very much concerned about mommy and daddy being able to come home every day and not be killed on the job or not contract uh, some disease 20 years after exposure or something. So I think we realize that this issue of toxic use reduction should be a natural link between our two movements. And our members understand that. Uh, let's take, for example, this issue of chlorine and chlorine dioxide use, just to give an example. Um, we're not, the use of chlorine and chlorine dioxide in the hair-making process contributes to hundreds of toxic chemicals in the environment, not just dioxin. And dioxin certainly is a, a great concern to us, but there are literally hundreds of organochlorines which result from the use of chlorine bleaching. Chloroform is a perfect example. Chloroform is a carcinogen. And it pervades the air in the mills where our members work. They are exposed on a daily basis in any kind of chlorine bleaching facility. Our members are exposed on a daily basis to chloroform, uh, which undoubtedly is a source of many of the, uh, the elevated levels of cancer that we see among our membership in these mills. Chlorine and chlorine dioxide themselves are extremely hazardous chemicals. If you ever Working in chlorine bleaching pulp is a very hazardous occupation because of the uh, not just the health hazards but the safety hazards associated with this. Uh, it's also, as you know, a, uh, the compounds themselves are very dangerous in surrounding communities. The residents of the town of Bay Maine learned this in a very graphic way in 1988 when, during a strike in international paper, because of the result of the company's insistence on using 40 trained workers to replace our members during that strike, there was a huge leak of chlorine dioxide. 121,000 gallons of chlorine dioxide uh, were released in JMA, resulting in a huge cloud over the town. It caused the evacuation of half of the town. 4,000 residents, including 1,200 school children, had to be evacuated because of this company's negligence. Uh, remember, chlorine dioxide, we twice as deadly as the methyl isocyanate that was involved in the tragedy in Boca uh, If, in fact, the temperature had been different on the day, February 1988, when IP released 121,000 gallons of chlorine dioxide, it would have killed many, many people because the gas was settled in the town instead of 
instead of going out. So our concern about um, environmental health really is that it has a very practical aspect to us. We understand it as well as anybody. Um, and our concern on environmental health is not really recent. Our union has stayed back to the late 60s and early 70s. Our union has been involved in this issue. Uh, in 1970, we trained local union leaders with 250 locals across the country on environmental issues, uh, which is really at the very beginning of perhaps the modern environmental movement in this country. Throughout the 1970s and 80s, we began to become more and more active in occupational safety and health issues, developing a very talented, very dedicated occupational safety and health staff to uh, serve our members. About the mid-1980s, when the docs and controversy really um, exploded into the news, uh, we began to look at that issue. We began to look at what the industry had done in Sweden, Scandinavia, and Western Europe, for example, in terms of getting away from uh, some of these toxic processes developing cleaner methods, safer methods for operation. As a result of a lot of the education that we did, we, our convention, the rank and file delegates to our convention in 1988 actually adopted a policy um, on the question of dogs and the toxic, toxic substance use in the paper industry. I brought copies, and I know that a lot of you may not have known, picked up the copies, so I think it might be helpful if I read to you um, the resolution. It was adopted in denial of the parts of it. It was adopted unanimously by the rank and file delegates to our convention. And in effect provides that whereas dioxin and other toxic coordinated substances are created in the process of chlorine bleaching paper pulp, dioxin and other toxic substances may be discharged in affluent, contaminated sludge, paper products, and paper dusts. Dioxin is bioaccumulated in the environment and may enter the human food and water supply. Dogs and pollution threatens the health of our members as workers and the health of our members' families. Our union strives to protect the health and safety of our members, our families, and the public, and to protect our natural resources. Therefore, be it resolved that the UBIU, our union, will seek consistent, feasible, and protective standards in both Canada and the U.S. to regulate the industry in both countries to minimize the threat of economic black health from the industry. Resolved that the UBIU will educate its members the hazards of dioxins and toxic substances and the methods available to control exposure. And further that, our union will work toward the introduction of technological and process changes that eliminate the creation of dioxins and minimize toxic substances in the paper making process. So, we're actually officially on record of endorsing one of the goals of the environmental movement, which is toxic use reduction, which is source reduction, to try to attack this problem at the source for the benefit of uh, not just us, but for the public at large. I'd like to spend a few moments just to talk to you about some of the practical considerations and coalition building between the labor and the environmental movement. You know, we can agree that toxic use reduction is, uh, should be a natural link for our movements. So what is the problem? And why have we been unable, uh, except in a variety of circumstances, to, to cooperate? And obviously, uh, the job security issue, and in some cases the use of job blackmail by the industry, is one of the problems. I mean, our members really do care about environmental health, uh, but they also care about the jobs that they depend upon and their families depend upon. Uh, and unfortunately, some companies, uh, some of the worst in our industry, are only too willing to manipulate the employees' fears about what effect environmental regulation will have on their own job security in order to drive a wedge between community residents and union members. And, you know, as, after all, um, you know, we're a labor union, and this concern about job security is a legitimate concern. And we are going to defend our members' job security. We're not going to do something which would threaten their job security. Uh, unemployment is a health issue. It's an issue that we should all be concerned about. We know for a fact unemployment causes a lot of health problems, including stress, alcohol, drug abuse, drug abuse uh, higher uh, rates of suicide. So it's a legitimate concern that people should be um, not be ashamed to uh, be concerned about. At the same time, you know, we can also all agree that, uh, for the most part, this job versus the environment today is a false effect. We have an interest. Our two movements have an interest in putting the lie 
to be able to supply sun in industry to drive us afar by exploiting this jobs versus the environment uh, issue. It's a false issue, especially in our industry. Uh, in fact, we can all agree that what we need to do is to see the industry invest capital resources necessary to have cleaner operations, not only so that uh, it can protect us the environment and the training community, but to protect the workers' health. And in the bottom, in the final analysis, to uh, protect the long-term job security of the mill itself. So, I'll just think for a few moments uh, and then close about some of the solutions to overcoming the barriers that sometimes exist between uh, labor and environmental cooperation. Uh, from the labor movement side, we recognize the need for more education on this issue. One thing I want the industry to understand, including the representatives of the industry who are here, our union does not respond to blackmail. Every effort made to manipulate our members is going to be met by more education on this issue. We're going to we're continuing right now to educate our members not only about the health issues involved, we're educating them that about the fact that the change from uh, toxic processes to non-toxic processes will not cause job loss in our industry. It need not cause job loss in our industry. And in fact, it improves job security. It improves job security in two ways, because when you have an industry beginning to invest more in these mills, they are investing in the job security of our members. They're ensuring the future viability of that mill for many years to come. And also, there's a consumer demand that's right. Only recently in London, the Financial Times of London, there was a report basically saying that because of the rising awareness of the consumer for environmental issues, especially in the paper industry, there is more and more consumer demand for uh, paper that's manufactured by cleaner processes. Those companies, such as in Europe, which are responding to that demand, are going to be able to compete in those markets in the future. Those industries, uh, which for those companies which refuse to address that issue and refuse to invest in technology necessary to clean up their processes are going to be left out in the cold. So if they want to guarantee, just from a strictly uh, business point of view, if you want to guarantee that you're going to be able to compete, especially in the European market, uh, but increasingly in this market, they're going to have to invest uh, to clean up their operations. We're going to educate our members about the fact that there are alternatives in this industry. Just like the last speaker said, there are technological you know, technologies that are existing today which can, in fact, move us away from chlorine and begin using uh, clean processes. Some of you may not have been able to get some of the materials that I bought today. This paper was manufactured for our members in Lyons Falls, New York, Lyons Falls Old Paper Company. 100% chlorine free paper. It's bright, it's white, it's strong, it's doable. I know uh, the industry can do more. Recently, just this past week, we received a uh, patent received by our national paper company in 1983 for a chlorine free bleaching process. Uh, this is very interesting to us because just as recently as April of this year, international, an international paper scientist was quoted from the Wall Street Journal as saying that there's all sorts of uh, terrible technological problems with chlorine free paper rating, uh, and that there are problems with both the, uh, the brightness of the paper and the strength of the paper. Uh, interestingly, in 1983, an IP scientist in this patent application was quoted as saying, chlorine compounds are difficult to handle and hazardous to both personnel and machinery. Chlorine salts readily corrode paper making equipment. Further, this part of the influence when chlorine based bleaching poses serious pollution problems. The patent, which is a beautiful piece of work, goes on to describe a oxygen based chlorine bleaching system. It's a continuous process using oxygen, hydrogen peroxide, and ozone uh, to develop what the patent is to be a very uh, bright paper and a very strong paper. Um, we were interested in why the company has failed to implement this technology in other mills. So we, we rung them up this week and asked them uh, if you have this patent, why haven't you used it? And of course, got a no comment, so I'll be very anxious to hear. Uh, we issued a press release yesterday, actually, 
on this patent. I'll be interested to hear uh, what excuse they have for not using technology which they have, been, they have had for many years. And I think that uh, something important uh, for people to understand is that there are actually long-term cost savings for the industry itself if they would simply uh, begin to invest what's necessary to switch over to cleaner processes. Studies have shown um, the cleaner oxygen delimification technology, for example, can result in enormously reduced chemical costs because oxygen is cheaper than chlorine after all. It can uh, uh, reduce costs in terms of wastewater treatment, sludge, because you're removing a lot of contaminants in the sludge, so you have uh, fewer solid waste disposal problems. The patent that I actually got was uh, in itself very interesting in that it admitted that if they can remove the chlorine, as Mary mentioned this morning, from their wastewater, from their uh, processed water, uh, they can actually recycle, recycle that water to have a continuous closed loop system. So I think the industry does, at least the international paper certainly understands, that they can do better, but for whatever reason, the IP at least refuses to do so. And from the environmental side, in terms of practical considerations in building a coalition, uh, I'd like to emphasize, I believe that environmentalists who get involved in public paper mill communities need to do a, a better job, really, in your public statements of emphasizing the job security issue, of emphasizing the interests of workers. Many of you do a very an excellent job of putting the lie to this job versus the environmental debate. But even those who do a really good job need to routinely bring that message to the public. The message needs to routinely reassure workers that we are not interested in shutting down mills, but we are interested in is having the industry invest in these mills so they will both clean up their operations, protect the health and safety of the worker, and in the end, uh, guarantee the long-term uh, prosperity of the mill and the mill town. Because remember, Sometimes these companies will say things uh, in public about how responsible they are, and they would like to do will invest in the technology necessary to keep the mill going. But that's not all, always the message that gets down to the shop floor. Some of the worst of the employers in our industry, and I rate IP uh, with them, uh, will manipulate our members on the shop floor and put the lie to them that you know if, if we have to do too much of the environmental stuff, then we may eventually have to curtail the operation here or shut it down. So I urge the environmental movement to routinely put the message out there. The goal, that is not the goal. The goal is to have a clean operation for everybody concerned. I think that you can do a lot to reassure workers and union members when you will acknowledge that, in fact, solutions will not come overnight. The technology does exist, but moving to the technology is not going to happen uh, at the drop of a hat. I think that Mary's comment this morning that there needs to be a phase out period uh, is a good message. Uh, we may or may not be able to agree on what the proper period is, but some employers are very good at manipulating workers with the lie that the environmental movement wants uh, solutions immediately. In other words, they want zero discharge now. Sometimes that's a nice slogan, but if in fact what you see is a phase out period, I think you should say that and say it very clearly. So that people understand that you are looking to protect the health and safety of everybody concerned, but you understand uh, that workers have an interest in job security and that uh, there may in fact be a period of time so there's not dislocation of workers uh, in transferring to cleaner technologies. Uh, I urge you to reach out and try to make contact. When you get involved in a paper mill community, to reach out to the local leaders involved in this organized plan, reach out to the employees. Understand that the first reaction that you get may not be positive. Understand that there are many decades of misinformation, misunderstanding, and fear to overcome. Uh, and keep trying. I think you need to just emphasize that you're interested in dialogue, and that dialogue never hurts, and that we need to try to just sit down together and sort out some of the issues and again, constantly reassure that what we're interested in is a long-term, um, clean operation for the benefit of everybody. I think emphasize natural coalition building uh, issues. There are some issues out there that everybody can be easily agree on. Ocean. I would like to see the environment talk more about the environment 
inside these plants. Safety and health, that sort of thing, your workers' health, your workers' concerned about your health. Uh, information, very powerful. I think everybody will agree that the, the industry needs to have maximum disclosure. We want the industry to be uh, up front with us as a union for workers. We want them to tell us about their operations. We want access to the information that we need to be able to defend our members' health and safety. And the community wants the same information. So I think that we have, there's a natural uh, alliance there in terms of our two movements pushing the industry to make the information available so that we can all act to protect ourselves and our communities. <coughs> now I'll close simply by um, emphasizing why I believe that we should continue to try to break down these barriers that sometimes exist between our two movements. And the simple answer is because it works. Workers have an enormous resource available to them. And that's their knowledge of the employer's operations, uh, which can be very useful for us to protect our health and safety, and useful to the community at large uh, to defend the, the uh, environmental health. As an example, I'll return to the town of Jay May to give you a little bit more idea of what happened there. In 1987, 1,100 community members uh, went on strike at an international paper company because of the company's outrageous demands uh, for concessions and contract negotiations. They began looking, even before that period, looking around to see other people being victimized by the same corporation, to look out into the community and reach out to other people who have problems with this corporate arrogance. Two months into the strike, the company, because of negligence, released 16.6 million gallons of untreated wastewater into the Andrews Cotton River. Our members and other community residents sat by helplessly watching this waste go down the river looking for uh, federal state governments to come and do something about it and finding very unresponsive uh, government bureaucracies. Two months later, or, uh, or several months later, in February 1988, the coin dioxide disaster happened. 121,000 gallons of coin dioxide, a huge green cloud hovering over the town of Jay, forcing evacuation of the residents. These kinds of, of disasters led to an alliance between labor and environment in the state of Maine. Our union members began searching out others. National Toxic Campaign and other environmental groups began searching us out. Out of that effort, uh, there were some tremendous positive results in terms of health, safety, and environment around Jay Maine. One thing which happened just a few weeks ago, an international paper company pled guilty to five felonies in federal court uh, for their environmental practices in Jay, including admitting to lying federal and state regulators about uh, their environmental practices. Uh, that happened because union members cared. Union members knew that there were problems and they reached out and shared information with the environmental community and with environmental regulators. I feel that when a company lies on the government forms, they should be brought to justice. And fortunately, because of the concern of our members in the JNA, we achieved a small measure of justice uh, international paper. The second thing is more, much more long lasting thing that happened as a result of um, this activism between our two movements was the Jay Environmental Ordinance. Jay Maine is probably the smallest town in America that had its own ordinance to protect the environment. And the way it came about is because union members during the strike and their allies in the community realized that the people who are being affected by companies' discharges ought to be the people who have a say in the company's operations. So they passed an ordinance, which really what it does is copy the uh, federal and state standards, but it brings the, the uh, enforcement to the local level. Uh, this eight and a half billion dollar multinational corporation swore they would never go to the town of Jay for not breaking the permit. They fought it in court. They uh, fought it uh, when it was originally passed. They waged, they financed, they recall the procedure. Every time uh, we stood up, for the right for local people to have a say in what they're being exposed to. Uh, when the First Circuit Court of Appeals upheld the ordinance, international paper very sheepishly came to the town of Jay, which, by the way, the entire town council consists of union members, and the planning board, which enforces the regulation, consists of striking former striking union members who have the right to decide whether or not this company is going to have an operating permit in the town of Jay. Yeah. 
done to protect the safety of the surrounding residents. Sometimes a crisis like this, and I'll close now, but sometimes a crisis like this brings us together. A crisis like in May May and Rain Strike, a crisis like the lockout in Guy's Farm, where the SAW members reached out to uh, environmentalists to force another multinational to come to terms. Uh, but I don't think we need to wait for a crisis. I urge the environmental movement to remember, in your activities, to remember the interests of workers, to reach out to the workers, to try to communicate uh, with them about their concerns and about your concerns, uh, and to emphasize your interest in workers' welfare, workers' job security, and all of your public statements. Our two movements will never have the exact same agenda. Uh, we won't always agree. But I think that we do have a common goal. We have a common interest in seeing to it that the industry invests, invests the resources necessary to protect the health of the surrounding community, to protect the health and safety of the employees in the mill, and the final analysis to guarantee the long-term future of these mills and the employees, the job security of employees that our union is proud to represent. Thank you. Thank you. 
come into the Department of Environmental Quality and talk about the mercury contamination at the old chlorine unit, chlorine production unit. And they use uh, mercury, what are called mercury cells, and they use a lot of mercury that's floating in these things, and it's very hot to make chlorine. I don't know exactly, I'm Paul kind to give us a flow chart up here, you can get the non-test problem. But basically, they're, they're using a lot of material, and there was a lot of loss of mercury in this process. All of you know about mercury and fish, and there's a concern about mercury. Now, when these guys talked about working in the mercury units to make chlorine, um, they talked about how there was a big door. The rooms where they worked in were very warm, and when the air went out of the room, this big building about the size of the city hall. When the air went out of that building, there was a, uh, on the right day, there, were mer there was a mercury mist outside. They were basically having mercury drizzle. All right? And every year, they had to replace tons of mercury in the process. They would have sumps outside the building where the mercury would flow, and they would have a, a heavy piece of equipment to pick up bucket of mercury that was uh, three feet by three feet by three feet, which is a lot of mercury. Stuff was all over the place. And at the end of the work day, probably the most uh, descriptive thing I've ever heard, at the end of the work day, the workers, before they would leave to go home, they'd lean over and do like this with their pockets to shake the mercury beads out, and unroll their cups, all right? Get the mercury out of their cups before they went home. Now, of course, they're bringing all this mercury home in their clothes, in their lungs, because when you're breathing this stuff in, your lungs are cooler than the air around you. So we've got some guys that probably, when uh, you know the highs and lows pass over, they get taller and shorter. Uh, I don't know. It's fun to make jokes with these guys, but um, they're pretty frustrated. And uh, nothing's been done with these hundreds of tons of mercury that's sitting in the ground. It kind of illustrates that BASF bought a whole bunch of coal one year, and they stacked it up uh, on a corner of the property outside of the contaminated area, and they were going to use it and decided not to. And then one day they decided they were going to use it, and they got out there and noticed that their coal had turned kind of gray as the mercury was percolating up through the ground, up through the coal. Uh, so now they got mercury contaminated toxic waste that used to be a fuel. Uh, I've got a jar of mercury in my office, in a little quart jar, where one of the workers just uh, this year kicked the ground with his with the back of his boot, made a little impression on the ground, and then was able to scoop the mercury out in, into the uh, quart jar. It, it's, so these workers are like frontline exposure. When they decided to close the chlorine unit, they had no say in what was going on or what kind of jobs necessarily they might get. They were successful in their lockout. Um, the OCW represents workers in a number of plants in Louisiana, but in the guys area, they have BASF and Vulcan. And um, Tom wants to give you just a few minutes, probably less than I've done. To, I just want to give you guys an illustration. I mean, when we start talking about chlorine exposure, there are a lot of other things that go into this. Most of us have absolutely no idea what workers in these plants are exposed to. You know, and they don't have a whole lot of recourse. And, and it's tough out there. So think about that when you start talking about those workers that want to keep cut trees and, and don't like the spot owls. There, there's some other science to this whole story. Tom? Tom has a book. I work with a coalition between the National Toxics Campaign and the OCAW, and this was an alliance that grew out of that five and a half year lockout of chemical workers at the BASF facility in Geyser. Um, and it's an alliance that was actually pulled together uh, with money last year, so that we're funded both by NTC and the OCAW. And uh, as Willie mentioned, some of the chemical workers in this union, local, which is 4620, work at Vulcan Chemicals in Geisner, where they produce chlorine. Chlorine is one of the most important products there. I'd like to raise a concern that chemical workers have, chemical workers.
factors in chlorine production units, especially. And that question is, what is going to be the impact of the phase out of chlorine production on chemical workers in these facilities? Now, this is no small question, since there are many thousands of workers employed in chlorine production units in the United States, and many in Louisiana. If there's a movement to phase out chlorine production, which I've been hearing today again and again, then it will no doubt draw opposition from chemical workers, even environmentally progressive chemical workers, which are union local has. It will draw opposition from them if there is no policy on guaranteed income for displaced chemical workers in the event that their jobs are phased out and that there is no alternate product line to kick in. After all, the chemical industry is a producer of toxics, not simply a user, but a producer. And if you decide to phase out some sort of chemical in the toxic use reduction process, you have to consider, you know, people losing their jobs because there may be no alternate product lines. So we can count on stiff opposition from chemical workers whose jobs are on the line if we push for a phase out, especially a rapid phase out of chlorine production. Chemical workers in Louisiana could be out of work, many of them. Now do we want this? I think Mark has alluded a lot to this. No, we don't want this. We are really natural allies and not natural adversaries. All right, we know this. Now the OCAW International Union has taken no position on chlorine production. They don't have a position yet. Or on dioxin standards. They don't have a position on dioxin standards. And the reason is because the issue of income security for chemical workers has not been resolved. The phase out of chlorine production may not occur, may not occur unless the future incomes of chemical workers in chlorine production facilities are secured. Now we can't even count on union locals which have been militant, been militant on health and safety issues and environmental issues um, for support in, in this phase out. We can't even count on OCAW Local 4620, which has been on the forefront of, of occupational safety and health issues and environmental issues in Louisiana. And in the past, even militant union locals have turned to support management as their jobs have become in danger. And they have ceased to become uh, progressive forces as they once were. As one of our union leaders recently said, Quote, we as workers can't be good environmentalists unless we've got a job. End of quote. And the chemical workers know full well that they know full well the dangers of working in chemical facilities. I don't need to go into that. Uh, they have to deal with this on a day-to-day -day basis. They know that dioxin is really dangerous. They don't want dioxin any more than anybody else. They just want a job. And that's the first issue of, of health for them. So, can the environmental movement afford to give in to this job blackmail of chemical workers? Well, it really doesn't need to be that way. And any phase out of chlorine production needs to be tied to an incomes policy. Specifically, it needs to be tied to a super fund for workers, um, for dis workers displaced by the phase out of chlorine. Not only chlorine, but a lot of other toxic chemicals that need to be phased out. Otherwise, we'll see cases like the carbon tetrachloride production plant in Lemoyne, Alabama. And this plant is shutting down its operations completely because of the phase out of ozone depleting chemicals, specifically carbon tetrachloride, which is due to be completely phased out by the year 2002. Now, there's no safety net for the workers there. And in fact, at the moment, they are employed dismantling the plant they worked at before as production workers with no insurance of having a job once that production facility is completely dismantled. So there's nothing waiting for them. They're building their own tombstone, if you might want to say. Um, as we move forward in demanding no more chlorine production, which I think is definitely the direction we 
should be moving in, we really need to push for legislation on an incomes policy to ensure, specifically, four years of full union level income for workers while they get a college education or other sorts of retraining, technical training. And the policy needs to prevent any potential downward mobility of workers um, by instead promoting education and training at work, um, as work, education and training as work, as paid work, and well-paid work at that. And of course, this will cost billions, but it is affordable, and it could be paid for by a tax on chemical feed stocks in production, or a tax on the production of ozone depleting chemicals. Almost done. For chemical workers, this is a question of economic justice. Not simply environmental justice, but economic justice, because do we sacrifice the economic health of these workers and their families in order to get zero discharge of dioxin? We have to decide whether we want chemical workers as allies or adversaries. Otherwise, there will be a political backlash if we don't incorporate an incomes policy into our demands for chlorine phase-out. In fact, phase-out May, may even be slowed if we don't have chemical workers as our allies because they may line up with manage, management to keep chlorine production going. And right now, we can't expect chemical workers and union support when legislating stricter dioxin standards. And as one of our union leaders at the Vulcan Chemicals plant recently said, without a super fund for workers, there's going to be certain opposition by chemical workers to stricter dioxin standards. And I hope we can all think about this in our daily work and in efforts to get a phase out of the flooring, because it's an important issue. Thank you. Basically, I think that the message here is something like, if we can have a GI Bill so that when uh, soldiers come home from fighting some war to protect us from whatever, uh, basically they're out of work soldiers. And if we can come up with a program to help support them, because uh, they support the national effort, uh, the workers in the industries that <clears throat> put their lives on the line to give us products ought to have some kind of support if we're going to put them out of work. that it? Yeah, something like that. Any questions? Take a few questions, and then uh, we're going to move to the next session. Uh, go ahead.
scale of public opinion and, and decision makers. So we're offering to grassroots, or, uh, grassroots environmental organizations uh, assistance in organizing, strategizing, fundraising, and media work. Uh, one thing that we that we do and groups that we work with is we stay with them uh, until their victory. If that takes six weeks, that's great. If it takes six months, that's fine. If it takes a year or two, that's okay too. Uh, we stay with the groups for the long haul and help them in the areas that they need help. Uh, many groups don't need help. They're, they they, they uh, go out and fight their battles and win their victories uh, very well without any outside help or with help from some of the organizations that are already, already available. But we're trying to fill in some of the gaps that exist in grassroots organizing. Uh, another thing that we do for the groups is, uh, when it's necessary, we actually produce material uh, for the groups, whether it's just brochures or, or um, outdoor advertising or videos or slide presentations or whatever. Uh, we actually produce those ourselves. Basically, we want to give uh, grassroots citizens the same access to the sophisticated tools and techniques that industry uses. And we feel that when grassroots environmental organizations are playing on a level playing field, that the truth will win. And that's what we want to see happen. Uh, what we're going to do uh, now is we're going to break out into three groups. In the rooms behind us on Twitter, there's A, B, and C. And uh, what we're thinking is the first three rows can go to room A, the second three rows can go to room B, and the third three rows can go to room C. And we will, the three of us will rotate through these rooms. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, strategy building. Francis is going to talk to you about crafting your message. And Martha's going to uh, talk to you about working with the media. So, after, and then we'll come back here. But before we do that, I have two quick messages. One is that the Florida Environmental Alliance, which is an, an alliance of about 40 or 50 grassroots environmental groups, is having a conference on October 18th, 19th, and 20th in Tampa at the uh, University of South Florida. And uh, we have uh, some of our workshops are going to be on alternative energy and alternative transportation, energy problems such as with coal, coal gas, nuclear energy, uh, hazardous waste incineration, uh, pulp paper, land use issues, and using regulatory agencies to protect the environment. Also, we're going to have uh, on Friday night a painful discussion about environmental legislation for Florida and upcoming legislation. So everyone's invited, whether you're looking for it or not. This conference is going to be a little bit different than many conferences around in that all the, uh, the workshops will be conducted by grassroots organizers in Florida who, are, who have been working on these issues and have been uh, heard very experienced in many of their successful efforts. We'll also have an ongoing uh, session of skills workshops at that. Uh, Brian Hunt would like to just take a minute to tell you about another workshop that is also coming up soon. Okay, I'm Brian Hunt. I'm uh, with Greenpeace's Southeastern Toxics Campaign. And what we're going to be doing is convening a region-wide uh, grassroots conference November 1st, 2nd, and 3rd in Atlanta at Emory University. This is for the eight states in particular that constitute EPA Region 4, but even if you're outside of EPA Region 4, you'd be more than welcome to attend. Uh, our conference is going to include workshops on military toxins, uh, on waste trade, on chlorine, on hazardous waste disposal, on solid waste issues, on pulp and paper, on offshore oil drilling, on bioaccumulation and zero discharge in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, on the REPRA initiatives this year. In addition, we're going to have skills workshops. Peter Dykstra, who's one of the most, I think, talented media directors in the country, is going to be doing workshops to help citizens activists become more adept at utilizing the media. We're going to have lobbyists there to help you develop skills in lobbying your legislators. We're going to have some wild-ass people from 
Greenpeace to do direct action workshops for you all. Uh, I'm very pleased with this conference. It's the most comprehensive conference we've had in the South. Uh, it's bringing together people from eight states, from all different types of toxic issues and environmental issues to form a unified movement across all race, class, and issue areas throughout the Southeast. We're going to culminate the, uh, the uh, conference on Monday the 4th, for those who can stay over. Uh, representatives from each of the states are going to go and confront EPA's Regional Administrator Greer Tidwell in his office face to face with the meeting. Two years ago when we had a conference, he refused to do it, so we took over the first floor of the EPA building in Atlanta. And uh, this time he's going to see us, whether he really wants to or not. The rest of the group is going to go over to the Center for Disease Control and demonstrate against Burnham Hout and the dioxin cover-up. So it's a very exciting conference. Everybody's uh, invited. If you would like more information on it, please stop by and see myself. Uh, and I've got a list. You can give me your name, number, address, all that stuff, and you'll get something this week in the mail about it. Thanks, Lynn. Right. Okay, please join us on Okay, come on, turn this one on. I'll try to come. I'm going to try to come. Okay, let me. I gave you my, did I? Yeah. Yes, you gave me your card. You will please send me something. I sure again. will. Okay. I'll do that. Yeah, I think I'm just going to do this. The demonstrates significant numbers. There have to be a lot of you to exert any force. And we have a system in this country that's already in place that we call the mass media that helps us disseminate messages. Now, um, and so in order to, to get your message out to enough people or to recruit enough people, um, you need some help. And you do that by working with the media. And some people